Among Karl Marx's early works, we find a piece called Estranged or Sometimes Alienated Labor, depending on how you want to translate the German term Entfremdung, which we'll talk about in, in just a moment. And this is a very useful piece for introducing students to, to reading Marx and to thinking about Marx's ideas, in part because it doesn't have some of the later baggage that's going to come with his, his other writings, and in part because what you can see him doing here in a very condensed form is talking about what modern industrial capitalist society does to people, and he's talking about it in ways that I think that many of us can relate to, at least in, in part. So he's going to discuss several different things in this piece, and we will hit on a few other aspects besides this, but one of the most important parts of this is his discussion of four modes of alienation. So we should think about this term alienation, or again in German, Entfremdung, and what it means. So to become alienated means to become other, to, for some sort of relationship to break apart or break down, for an antagonism to arise. These are all ways of thinking about alienation. Marx is going to think about it particularly in terms of what was originally oneself becoming something that is no longer oneself, that, that is standing over against oneself. So it's kind of a, a splitting that's going on within the human being or in the products of the human being or in relations between human beings. And I've got some stuff here that we're going we're gonna to play with in a moment, and we're going to look at each of these four kinds of, of alienation in turn. He's going to chart out a kind of progression. So we're going to start with alienation of the person from the product of, of labor, and that leads into alienation of the person from the very activity of work. That leads into this kind of tricky passage that actually, you know, the terminology is kind of kind of uh, difficult if you're not used to some of the, the philosophical assumptions going on, but the basic idea is, is very easy to, to understand and relate to, the person from their species being. And then finally we get to the alienation of persons from other persons. And Marx says that it works this way. We don't actually begin in a state of antagonism as many other social theorists have, have uh, assumed. And so this is a good place to start going into the manuscript itself. He's criticizing what he calls political economy. And what we understand um, today by, by sort of a mixture of political theory and economic theory would be what he's calling political economy at the time. Um, or policy making is another, another term for it. And one of the basic assumptions that was being made by much of the political economy that he's dealing with, like for example Adam Smith, is that you have these, these free individual agents who relate to each other by producing and, and trading their property with each other. And this makes sense actually for certain kinds of, of society. Uh, Marx talks about handicraft work and you know what goes into labor uh, and, and what the, the person receives from it, but this actually doesn't this doesn't replicate the way things really work in much of, of uh, ancient society or medieval society, and it certainly doesn't, doesn't answer to what's going on in modern society. It's kind of a smokescreen. Now, Marx doesn't say, you know, well, it's, it's just to be thrown away. He says, there's some ideas here that really matter, like, for example, private property. They begin from the assumption of private property. They don't analyze it further. What we want to do, Marx says, is think about, well, where does private property actually come from? How does it come into existence? How does it come into being? So political economy, the problem with that is that they're, they're assuming things rather than actually examining and analyzing them. And so that the explanations that they give are rather circular or they're rather superficial. They don't get at the real heart of the matter. And what is Marx keen to understand? The condition of human beings in modern capitalist societies. So what we need to do then, he says, is we need to, instead of going back to some sort of primitive condition or some abstract doctrine, we need to proceed from what he calls an actual economic fact. We need to begin with something that actually happens. 
Here's the fact that he begins from. The worker becomes all the poorer the more wealth he produces, the more his production increases in power and size. And that sounds a little paradoxical, doesn't it? If somebody's producing a lot of value, shouldn't they be getting paid more? Well, you know, that's not the way things often do work. Um, many of you watching this, I'm sure, have worked wage jobs where the more that you produce, you don't actually get paid more. You get paid by the hour for what you do. Or you get paid a salary for a given amount. And if you go beyond that, you know, there could be bonuses or incentives, but you're certainly not getting the lion's share of the value that, that you're producing for, for somebody else, for perhaps an institution, or perhaps an owner, or stockholders. So, why does the worker then become poorer the more wealth he produces? Because he's producing value that he doesn't partake in. So it means that relative to that value that's, that's out there, he or she has less of it. And the more that they do this, the more that workers, in the plural, do this, the more the process turns against them, according to Marx. So he says, um, the worker becomes an ever cheaper commodity the more commodities he creates. The devaluation of the world of men is in direct proportion to the increasing value of the world of things. This is a very interesting idea. And this goes back to the, the, what I've got up here. The basic process that's going on through production is that you've got somebody who's a worker, and that person is expending labor, which is coming from themselves. It's their own energies. It's their own attentiveness. It's their own, um, you know, focus and choices of what to do. Even if you're working a, a what seems to be totally routine job where you feel like you're just, you know, stamping widgets on an assembly line, you are investing something of yourself in that activity. And what comes about is some sort of object, a product. Now, in many cases, when a person produces something, think, for example, of cases where you're not producing something for sale, but you're producing something for your own use. Um, if, for example, you enjoy cooking, and your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend comes home and you've made a wonderful meal, uh, and that you're going to enjoy it together, and you've even done things like, you know, put on the romantic music, and the candlelight, and tablecloth, and gone to a lot of, you know, a lot of work for that. that you, you've put something of yourself onto that table. Now, it's not totally of yourself. It's not like you, you know, cut into yourself and cooked up a steak of, of flesh or something like that. That would be kind of disgusting, wouldn't it? But what you've done is taken raw materials, and you've taken tools... And you, as the creator, have harnessed those things and created something new. And now you get to sit down and, and enjoy it. Cuisine is an interesting example because when a product is created, it's created precisely in order to be destroyed by being consumed. So even artworks that are culinary are not meant to last. What if you build yourself a house? Or you weave yourself a cloak, or you knit yourself a, a sweater, or macrame, or whatever it is that people do with that sort of thing. Well, you get to enjoy the product, and you get to say, I made that. Um, you get to see something of yourself in what it is that you've done. When you write a paper, for example, if you're just sort of going through the motions, there's not that much of yourself in the paper. When you really invest yourself in doing research and synthesizing multiple points of view, and deciding which one you're going to argue for and which one you're going to argue against, there's a lot of you in there. Plato says, for, you know, for example, in one of his dialogues, um, that uh, people often treat the things that they make as if they're their own children, because they see something of themselves in there. So the laborer, in certain conditions, is able to externalize... themselves into the product, which then they can enjoy. But in many cases, the product 
doesn't belong to the laborer. The product in wage labor, in modern industrial labor, belongs to the one who has provided the means of production, the one who has provided the conditions under which it can be produced, the conditions of work. As a matter of fact, even the labor of the person doesn't belong to the person when they're being hired. But they're doing the same thing of externalizing themselves. They're creating something that stands over against them as an object. And as they create more and more, they're giving more and more of themselves to something else. They're putting more and more of themselves out into the social world, and there's less and less of them there because it's being taken away. So Marx goes on and he says, um, labor's product, the object that labor produces, confronts it as something alien as a power independent of the producer. So in a lot of jobs, when, when you've created something, that thing confronts you as something independent of you. The product of labor is labor, which has been embodied in an object. You are embodying your labor in, in the, the object there, in what you're making, which has become material. This is something really distinctive about human beings. I mean, other animals do labor to a certain extent. You know, ants build anthills, and they're pretty, you know, pretty impressive. And bees make these amazing, uh, you know, lattice works of, of honeycombs. But we do much more than that. And as individuals, we're able to see ourselves in our products, and we're also able to see the loss of ourselves in, in our products. So he, he goes on and he says, labor's realization is its objectification. That's what it means to actually labor. If you're laboring and you don't produce any products, you're not actually laboring, you're just screwing around. You're not actually making anything. Um, you're maybe just having some fun. You might say, well, what about the fun? Maybe that's a product. Well, you know, that's, that's not the same thing as what Marx is talking about here. The, the very nature of labor is to produce things that stand against us as independent, independent existences. Now, some of these objects or some of these products might be things like tools. Or they might be things like raw materials. Or they might be things like machines. Right? And these things can go back into this whole process here and feed into it so that um, the laborer is relying upon those things. But he's being confronted, or she's being confronted, by them. They are the product of somebody else's labor, but they're not being confronted by them as labor. They're being confronted by them as things, things that impose demands. You know, if I'm working at a drill press... Um, you know, you got to be kind of careful with those. I'm thinking years back uh, when I was actually in contact with those sorts of things. I don't know what they're like today. Maybe they're totally computerized. But you had to be kind of careful with them. You could mess yourself up on those um, because they, you know, they are something independent of you. You put your hand in the drill press, you're not going to have a hand because the drill press is not going to think about should I do this or shouldn't I do this. Um, but that drill press is actually the, consolidated, the consolidation of somebody else's labor. That drill press belonging to the factory owner is the product of not the factory owner's labor, but some other worker in some other plant. So he says, um, the, labor's, the laborer's uh, realization appears as loss of realization. So the worker realize, or loses realization, re, re, loses becoming you know, what they're supposed to be, to the point of starving to death. The, the industrial processes lead to economic processes in the marketplace that, according to, to Marx, are going to depress wages lower and lower and lower and lower, so that the workers are getting a smaller and smaller share of the wealth that's being generated. Even if there's like a net increase in the amount of pay, it could be that the workers are getting less and less of a share of the economic boon or production. And eventually it can get to the point where they are just hanging out. So he says, um, so much does objectification appear as loss of the object that the worker is robbed of the objects most necessary not only for his life but for his work. Labor itself becomes an object. 
that can be bought and sold. Labor itself becomes an object which he can obtain only with the greatest effort and the most ir irregular interruptions. Instead of the laborer being able to like come out and say, look, I, I've got talent, I've got skills, I've got energy, just put me to work, the laborer has to go to other people and beg them to allow the laborer to work on stuff to make products for them. This is what we call filling out a job application, going to interviews. I think many of you know what that sort of thing is like. And so the, the net process is that the laborer is becoming alienated from the product that he or she is, is developing. Um, he says, the more that the worker by his labor appropri appropriates the external world, the more he deprives himself of the means of life in two respects. The external world more and more ceases to be an object belonging to his labor, to be his labor's means of life. Second, it more and more ceases to be a means of life in the immediate sense, means for the physical substance of the worker. The worker gets worse and worse off in relation to the world of things. So he says, the worker becomes a servant of the object. The object asserts itself over against the worker. The worker receives work. He doesn't just do work, he has to wait for somebody to say, okay. And he, re he receives a means of substance by this. He said, Mark says, this enables them to exist first as a worker, second as a physical subject. And notice, it's only as a worker that he can maintain himself as a, as a physical subject, and it's only as a physical subject that he's a worker. So, you know, I mean, this is something to think about in the age of automation, where we're replacing a lot of people by uh, computers and by machines and robots. Human beings require some sort of goods in order to keep on surviving. In an industrial society like the one that we live in, um, you know, taking aside you know, the, the welfare system or safety net or you know, if we ever end up having a guaranteed basic income, if you don't work, you're going to, you're going to starve. You're going to, to die because you won't get anything to, to eat. And the worker more and more has to fit him or herself into the demands of the object that is being created and the objects that have been created. So, um, Marx talks about this in, in two interesting ways. He says, um, it's true that labor produces for the rich wonderful things, but for the worker it produces privation. It doesn't actually make the worker better off. It produces palaces, but for the worker hovels. It produces beauty, but for the worker deformity. So that's one aspect of the alienation here. The person, by investing their labor, is actually losing something of themselves in the process and not getting anything back. Marx has some really interesting remarks about machines as well. He says, it replaces labor by machines, but throws one section of the workers back into barbarous types of labor, and it turns the other section into a machine. It produces intelligence, but for the worker, stupidity, cretinism. So, you know, modern industrial work tends to require two kinds of labor. Unskilled labor, the machine then can compensate for that. You just push the buttons, and you just stand there pushing buttons all day. You know, um, the Jetsons is a great example of that. George Jetson was living in this, you know, sort of utopian society where his only job is to sit at his desk and, and one hour a day push a button, because that's pretty much all he can do. Now, that's not developing human talent. That's not developing human capacities. That's not allowing anybody to do anything interesting. And that's kind of a jokey one, too, because for a lot of people, unskilled labor means doing back-breaking stuff that, you know, we don't have machines to do quite yet, or the, the human beings are just a little bit better at it than, than the current existing machines. The other possibility is... Um, labor that's skilled, but that becomes more and more and more professionalized. That becomes more and more, you know, routinized. And it, it becomes less and less one investing oneself and more just one selling one's labor to, to get things done. So Marx goes on and he says, um, the relationship of the man, uh, of means to the objects of production and production itself is just a consequence of this, this first relationship. The direct relationship of labor to its products is the relationship of the worker to the objects of production. So we have alienation of the person 
from what it is that they're producing. The first form of alienation. Now the second form is stemming from this. And Marx will focus now on the activity of work. He says, so what's the alienation of labor? The labor is external to the worker. It doesn't belong to his intrinsic nature. In his work, he doesn't affirm himself, but denies himself. He does not feel content, but unhappy. He doesn't develop freely his physical and mental energy, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. So the activity of work, when it's left up to the person, they will choose the kind of work that they actually find fulfilling. And that doesn't mean that they'll always do exactly the same thing, like they'll decide, you know, when they're 18 years old, well, I'm a musician, or I'm a mason, or I'm a carpet layer, and just do that, because they may, they may develop, and they may grow, and they may um, decide, I want to take some classes and do something else. Maybe I'm going to become a doctor. Maybe I'm going to learn history and become a historian. Maybe I'll learn how to code. As new opportunities become available, people, if they're in a condition where they can actually choose the kind of work that they want to do, they'll steer themselves towards that. And people do find work fulfilling when it's the kind of work that they actually freely choose. Now, you might say, well, people freely choose to go and work, you know, at a fast food restaurant or in uh, janitorial services or join, you know, to join the military or whatever. Well, you know, there's, there's free and then there's free. A lot of cases, there's not an awful lot of options and a person needs to be able to eat and sustain themselves and sometimes their family, so they have to take what they can get. Um, a lot of adjuncts, for example, are, are in that condition. It's one thing to say, um, well, if you don't like teaching for a profession, um, just go find yourself a full-time job teaching. Well, if there's no jobs, you, you can't do that. Um, well, go do something else. Well, you know, if that's what you find fulfilling, you're probably not going to find, you know, doing something else as, as fulfilling. So what happens is the activity of work itself in industrial society um, it's, you could say, dictated. It's not chosen. Or it's chosen only within certain ranges. Um, you know, if the mill is the only real job in town, other than maybe working in the saloon or sweeping floors, you, you work at the mill, whether you're suited for that sort of thing or not. So this means that the labor becomes, as Mill says, external to the worker. It's not something that they have a desire or a drive to do. So what, what's the, the consequence of this? The worker feels himself outside, only feels himself outside his work, and his, wor in his work feels outside himself. Work becomes alienating in that case. When we talk about work being soul-crushing, that's, that's you know, an extreme form of alienation. When you dread having to get up in the morning and face the commute to go into your workplace, this is exactly what Marx is talking about right here. The work becomes something that you want to avoid. Now, human beings want to be themselves. They want to actually express themselves. You know, when, when you can work in, in expressive ways, like, thank God I've got this, because I get to actually do something I enjoy, talk about philosophy. It's, you know, it's not onerous work. It is still labor. It does still take effort. But you enjoy it. You put yourself into it. So it creates a kind of divide between the realm of what I have to do, what I'm stuck doing, what I have to show up for 40 hours a week, or, you know, in Marx's day, many more hours than that, and where the person finds themselves and what's left for, for most people. What Marx calls animal functions. Eating and drinking. 
having sex. Um, trying to create the conditions under which you can have sex. That, that can often take a lot more time than by having sex. Uh, he talks about, you know, um, the equivalent of preening. He, his, his phrase is actually, um, where is it? Dr dwelling and dressing up, you know. Um, those are things actually that animals do. They, they to some degree, decorate their nest. They build, you know, little things. They putter around. They play. Those are all good things, by the way. Marx is not knocking any of those things. But he's saying that when we detach them from the world of work, we're losing what nowadays we call work-life balance, right? Some people will, like, throw themselves entirely on this side and the rest of their life, you know, suffers as a result. Some people can't wait to get out of work because work sucks for them. And they're, they're, they're saying, I can't, you know, I can't stand being here. As soon as that, that time clock goes, I'm out of here. And don't bother me over the weekend. I don't want to hear about it. As a matter of fact, a lot of those people are hard to get any work out of at work. So what happens here is there's this splitting that takes place. And again, human beings are alienated from themselves. They're unable to be realized in, in their, their workplace. So he says, these are, you know, eating, drinking, procreating are genuinely human functions, but taken abstractly, separated from the sphere of all other human activity and turned into sole and ultimate ends, they become just animal functions. We lose our nature as human beings. So, you know, when, when people would look down on the workers and say, yeah, look at those people, all they do is get drunk and, and screw around and you know, gamble, and, you know, obviously they're only good for putting in the mill or putting in the factory. Marx would say, well, that's because you've been putting them in the factory. That's because you haven't given them any work that they can actually take any delight in, any pride in, that they can identify themselves with. So that's the, 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 the second thing. Now we get to one that's a little bit more... Um, tricky or perhaps even a little mystifying for some people reading this for the first time. But again, you'll see that this is not anything all that, um, all that hard to relate to. He talks about us as being species. Being. So, you know, what, what is the kind of species we are? The human species. We are humanity. And each human being is a member of humanity. So I'll depict that just by going like this. Each individual is a little part of humanity. Now, what is definitive of humanity? This is where Marx starts getting very metaphysical. He starts talking about the natural world. Right? Inorganic nature, organic nature. So this inorganic nature business is everything that's, that's not living. Organic nature we make use of primarily by eating. You know, we, we eat other animals, we eat plants. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you know, you only eat one of those. But um, the rest of us eat both of them. And we take things from the natural world to, to continue our, our existence. And every animal does this. And... Other animals also take things from the inorganic world. So, you know, when, when bees are making um, their honeycombs, I'm not sure exactly what it's made of, but I'm willing to bet that it's not all made of organic material, that they're getting some of it from somewhere else. Um, and they're, they're relating to their environment. So we human beings do that as well, but we do that in a much more expansive way. Because we are um, beings that are... Conscious. We relate to the rest of the natural world through consciousness, and we really are the consciousness of the other natural world. So Marx will talk about the, the um, natural world as being our inorganic body. So think of it, the human being, as, or the human species, as being in the world as being, you know, what, what in some ways makes the world turn, makes the world what it is. This is a humanistic, humanocentric perspective that Marx has. How do we do that? We do that in part through theoretical activities, through, through thinking about the world. 
but we do this mostly through practical activity. Through production, through taking things from the natural world and making them into other things. And we do this through free choices, through actions that we will. That is what it means to be human in this sense, to be of the essence of humanity, to, to be part of the species being. That's what, human be that's what makes us human beings. What does modern industrial production do? cuts us off from that. It turns our species being as productive being into mere means to continue our individual existence. We take our capacity to do what's, in, in Marx's view, the highest function of human beings, to, to do work, productive activity, to take the, the world and transform it, and we turn it into a way to, to make a buck so that we can buy our groceries, and pay for our gas, and make it from, you know, from paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And Marx, by the way, is not blaming the people who, who are stuck in that situation. He's blaming the people who impose that upon them. And he's saying, what this does is it isolates us from human being. Because human being, over here, is seen as where value resides, where meaning resides. You know, sometimes people talk about living the real life. That's over here. If you're stuck working all the time, and working in a profession where you don't make much, you know, and you're getting your, most of your labor is being appropriated for somebody else, and you're not valued, you begin to think of your life as not that meaningful, and other people as doing what it is to really be human. That's a profound form of alienation, to be alienated from what Marx calls species being. Finally, we get to the, the fourth kind of alienation. I'm not going to put anything up on the board because I don't actually need to. We're alienated from other people. The workers don't exist in a kind of solidarity with each other by, by you know, virtue of the fact that they work together. They actually have an antagonistic relationship to each other much of the time. Because, you know, if, if I see myself as this alienated, unhappy being, well, that other poor sucker over there is pretty much the same thing. Why would I care about what happens to him? If people are dehumanized, if people are alienated, detached from their labor, detached from productive activity, detached from the very meaning of the species, then it's not very, you know, much of a stretch to say they don't matter. They matter insofar as they get in my way. And so there's a lot of antagonism, competition, enmity that takes place. But this is happening because this alienation of person from person, seeing the other as just an other, not as another self, not as being like me, happens because of all of this alienation here. So if you could find some way to eliminate this kind of alienation, that would affect this kind of alienation. That would become a thing of the past. Now, Marx has a few other things that he thinks are important to, to think about in, in this uh, manuscript. And I, I'm not going to actually hit on all of them. I just want to hit on one. There's a character that we haven't really been talking about throughout this whole thing. So, you know, if the, the worker um, and the product and the work has been alienated from the worker, who does it belong to? This is the question of private property. Where did private property come from? Well, it came from expropriating the, the work, the labor, of the worker and its fruits, the product. So Marx says, um, you know, who is this actually, um, who is this benefiting? Who is taking this? He says, 
Let's see how this concept of estranged, alienated labor must express and present itself in real life. If the product of labor is alien to me, if it's become other, if it's become foreign, if it confronts me as an alien power, then to who does it belong? If it's not belonging to me anymore, if my very vitality, my very energy, my, my creativity, my everything that I put into my work isn't really mine, well, then whose is it? So this is an interesting question. Maybe it's the gods. And in primitive societies, this is an answer that people often give. According to Marx, he says, in the earliest times, uh, the principal production, you know, building of temples, appears to be the service of the gods, and the product belongs to the gods. But then he says, the gods on their own were never the lords of labor. No more was nature. So the gods are just a stand-in for something else. For other people. Well, who are these other people then? Well, you know, we have to sort of do a process of elimination. It's not the worker. It's not the vast majority of the people that are actually doing work and generating things. It must be what we can call the elites. They're the ones who are expropriating it. And in, in modern society, the elites are the bourgeois, the modern capitalist uh, class. It's no longer the nobility or you know, the military class or any of those sorts of things. It becomes the, the bourgeois, the people who own the means of production. As he says, um, you know, it belongs to some other man than the worker. If the worker's activity is a torment to him, to another it must give satisfaction and pleasure. And he says, notice here that a person's relationship to themselves becomes objective and actual through their relationship to the other person. So, how does the bourgeois see the, the human being? This is where we can skip ahead. He has some really interesting things to say about this. Um, I'm going to skip over the equality of wages discussion and all that towards the, the very end, where he says, and these are just sort of reflections that he doesn't follow up on. He says, everything that appears in the worker as an activity of alienation, of estrangement, appears in the non-worker as a state of alienation and estrangement. So the bourgeois himself or herself is not entirely, you know, integrated with it. They're in a state of alienation. This is an activity of alienation. The worker's real practical attitude in production and to the product appears the non-worker confronting him as a theoretical attitude. So we have practice and we have theory over here, or you might say working and management. Then he says, the non-worker does everything against the worker which the worker does against himself but he does not do against himself what he does against the worker. And what Marx is saying here is that this process of alienation involves the worker actually doing part of this to themselves because the bourgeois is inflicting this upon them as the conditions under which they have to work. So it becomes very difficult to just say, well, just don't be alienated. No, because this becomes a condition of being that is self-replicating that not only is self-replicating in the individual, but also in their culture, among their fellow employees, among their you know, family, among their, their class, among their workers. This is where the alienation of persons from other persons makes a, a big difference here. So we've seen uh, the various ways in which human beings are alienated in industrial society. It turns out to be quite complex, doesn't it?